Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Moises Agosto. I'm the director of treatment for EMAC. And today we have a very exciting webinar on a topic that is very relevant to those of us that are aging with HIV over the age of 50 and also for long-term survivors. A lot of us, because of our the extension of our work, uh, taking the medications, have developed resistant along the way, multi-drug resistant for some of us. Um, others have not don't have the same ability to suppress viral load, like, like we uh, also face issues of adherence. So there are many issues that relate us to the conversation about HIV drug resistant. Um, also, you know, we need to be able to talk to our doctors about this and also have the doctors be knowledgeable about the kind of testing and the kind of analysis that need to happen in order for us to continue to have antiretroviral treatment. Today we have a great panel, bless you. Uh, we have a wonderful panel today. Um, we have with us Dr. Gandhi, Monica Gandhi. She is an expert in infectious diseases and she's specialized particularly in the care of patients with HIV and AIDS. Uh, in her research, um, Gandhi has a special interest in HIV in women, including differences between women and men in exposure to antiretroviral medication and responses to therapy. The work on these subjects has been widely published. She earned her medical degree at Harvard Medical School. At USC SF, she completed an internal medicine residency and an infectious disease fellowship as well as a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. During her infectious diseases fellowship, she, she earned a Master of Public Health degree in epidemiology and biostatistics at the University of California in Berkeley. Welcome, Monica. Um, we also have uh, Nelson Bergel. Nelson is a 35-year-old long-term HIV and cancer survivor. He is an author, a lecturer and a leading health advocate. Uh, he holds a chemical engineering degree from McGill University in Montreal and an MBA from the University of Houston. He is an expert on the body.com on aging with HIV, lipodystrophy, hormone deficiencies, and multidrug resistance. He's the co-founder of the AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition and successfully led efforts to convince the FDA and pharmaceutical companies to enable HIV positive people with limited, limited treatment options to access multiple investigational agents simultaneously. He's now focused on advocating for research option for the immunological not responder population. So we are going to have uh, start our webinar with uh, Dr. Gandhi. She will provide us with a clinical perspective, and then we'll have Nelson offering the community and advocacy perspective. So with us, Dr. Monica Gandhi. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to talking about kind of the clinical considerations in HIV resistance. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in this, you know, the way to think about resistance is obviously it's just, um, it's just mutations in the virus that make it less susceptible to different antiretroviral medications. And sometimes these mutations are very advantageous for the virus. It, um, you know, makes it evade, uh, unfortunately, drugs that we're using, but it can actually cause decreased viral fitness. Um, but it's really from selective drug pressure, meaning giving medications to a patient and maybe having a hard time taking the medications perfectly all the time. Uh, life, you know, adherence can be difficult, especially if there's toxicities to the drugs. And then the virus sees some of the drug and not every day, and then that can lead to evolution of resistance. Um, and so it's really suboptimal dosing or partial adherence, or even drug-drug interactions, or not absorbing it as well, that makes the virus see less of the drug than it needs to, and it can evolve resistance. Next slide. Um, so when we think about where we are 
in the HIV response. I always try to mention that, you know, there have been major setbacks in the HIV response during these last three years of the COVID pandemic. And in fact, UNAIDS, when it put out its um, biannual report in 2022, they called the report in danger. And what they meant in danger is that we're at our highest number of HIV infections worldwide, 38.4 million people living with HIV, many more new infections in 2021 than we expected. Unfortunately, 1.5 million new infections last uh, the year before last, as opposed to we were hoping we'd be less than a million. 650,000 deaths from AIDS last in 2021. 40.3 million people have died from HIV since the beginning of the epidemic. And only 75% of adults have full access to antiretroviral therapy worldwide. 52% of children with all the disruptions that occurred from the pandemic, including school closures, had an increase in rates of new infection in young women and adolescent girls. Next slide. So where do we think about resistance? And what do we know? Next slide, please. And where do we know about resistance at this moment? Um, so let's have the next slide. Oh, wait. Yeah, thank you. So um, we don't actually have an updated report from the World Health Organization since 2021. Because of all these disruptions that have occurred because of COVID, we don't have an updated look on where we are with um, HIV resistance around the world. Next slide. But I'll tell you where we are in the resistance um, around the world. Um, as of 2021, 28.8 million people receiving ART worldwide. And at this point, about 10% resistance in the NNRTI class, the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The old ones from that were afavirenz and nevirapine, and then the newer drugs in that class of NNRTIs are um, draverine, ropivirine, atraverine, but the at least what we have in terms of resistance to what used to be first-line therapy worldwide, we're already at 10% resistance worldwide of NNRTIs. And it's the most common drug class where there's resistance. And that has a lot of implications for babies born to mothers who have HIV or transmitted drug resistance. And if you get a virus, you're more likely to be resistant to drugs in this class. Next slide. What do we know about resistance? Um, to other classes. Well, actually, this is a little hard to see, sorry, but in terms of resistance to other classes, including the first-line therapy worldwide integrase inhibitors, there's a very low rate of resistance to these other medications. So that's really good news for the integrase inhibitors because integrase inhibitors are first-line worldwide, first-line in the U.S. The next slide, please, shows us what's happening in um, the U.S. So this is just pu uh, data published in March of 2022 in Clinical Infectious Diseases. And again, it's sort of data that's behind because by the time you get it published, it's kind of old data. But at least right now, the prevalence in this country of NNRTI resistance, um, that group of drugs we just talked about is 12.5%. The rate of resistance to nukes which are our backbones like tenofovir, abacavir, 3TC is 7%. The rate of resistance to protease inhibitors is 4%. And the rate of resistance to the integrase inhibitors, which are the, uh, which are the, um, the, uh, the ones that we use you know, as first-line therapy in this country, is very low, uh, less than 1% drug resistance in this clinical infectious disease article. The next slide, please, shows us kind of the individual mutations and what their prevalence is. And I'll just say that K103N, which is a mutation that leads to afavirenz and nevirapine resistance, is the most common mutation in this analysis. Um, and again, anything else is much less than drug resistance to the non-nukes, which not a lot of people are on at this point. Next slide. So, what are we supposed to do with resistance testing? What are the recommendations from the Department of Health and Human Services about resistance testing? Well, you know, the recommendations are really that everyone should get a resistance test when they enter into care, but then anyone who is failing therapy in this country, and resistance testing is unfortunately not as prevalent and available worldwide because it's expensive, but in this country, anyone who's failing therapy 
as long as the viral load can be sequenced, because you need your viral load to be a little higher, usually above 500, to be able to do a resistance test, that everyone should get a resistance test if they're having low level viremia or any failure to the medications. Next slide, please. And the thing about resistance testing is it tells you what's going on in your plasma, but it doesn't actually tell you necessarily what's going on in some minor mutations, like kind of our, our um, cellular reservoir of virus. But it's as good as it gets, meaning we really are only able to measure in a, in a good way resistance in um, our plasma. Uh, there are some tests to look at resistance in HIV DNA in the reservoir, but it's it's been hard to, harder to figure out what that means. Next slide. So then, um, uh, so how do we, you know, what do we actually sequence? Well, if you think about the major drug classes that are used, you have to remember the life cycle of the virus. The virus enters the cell. It then, there is a place where its RNA of the virus goes to DNA. And that process is called reverse transcription, the RNA going to DNA. And, um, and the thing about that part of the virus is that, um, is that, uh, is that there's nukes that work there, what we call nukes, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and there's non-nukes. Um, so those are the ones that we just talked about. Then the DNA of the virus goes into the host cell chromosome and integrates into the host cell chromosome, and that process is stopped by the integrase inhibitors. So that's where that class of medication works. And then the virus is now integrated into the host cell chromosome and it makes new um, virus particles. But it, when it's making new virus particles, there's a big protein that's made and that protein has to be cut up into little pieces by the protease. And so protease inhibitors are the final group of medications that we use. And so what are we sequencing when we look at an HIV genotype? We're sequencing the reverse transcriptase gene, the integrase gene, and the protease gene. These are the ways to tell if there are any mutations that bring down the susceptibility of the virus to the drugs that we use to treat HIV infection. Next slide, please. So where we are in the world, um, next slide, actually, I'll just go ahead. Um, so the, where we are in the world, uh, next slide again, um, is that we actually really do have a good way to measure resistance. And we have a lot of medications that can work against resistance organisms. And I think that's extremely key. Next slide, please. And the reason I really want to talk about that is um, that we're really in an era where we've developed a lot of new medications that work against resistance mutations. I always tell HIV providers that I think that they should memorize these particular mutations. And I make the fellows in our program memorize these 12 mutations. And what they are, are the mutations that developed when people had used some of those older medications. A lot of long-term survivors um, were put on these older medications, AZT, D4T, DDI, um, 3T, DDC, D3T, 3T, 3TC. And these medications, you know, were really kind of old-fashioned and they did lead to, um, if you fail them, they could lead to what are called TAMs or thymidine-associated mutations. And those are M41 and D67 and K70R and L210 and T215 and K219. And essentially, those mutations are memorized. I Or we, we really try to encourage people to memorize them so that they know how to interpret someone's genotype. And then there's a very specific mutation, M184V, that confers resistance to a very commonly used medication, which is lamivudine or 3TC. K65R confers resistance to tenofovir and L74V to abacavir. And then there's these NNRTI mutations. So we actually ask people to memorize mutations. And then I have on my phone um, uh, contacts that give me the mutations to things like darunavir, Duravarine and other drugs so that I can always look them up and have them handy. Next slide. So why do we know, you know, that we're in a place where we have a lot of medications that are used for drug resistance? Because the drug companies luckily have developed a lot of drugs that really work against um, uh, drug resistant mutations. The one thing is that darunavir, ritonavir, 
which is the drug that's found in the brand name Simtuza, even if there's a lot of resistance in the background, darunavir ritonavir often works. And the next slide, uh, please, shows us all the darunavir ritonavir mutations. And actually, you have to have a lot of mutations in the protease inhibitor class for darunavir not to work. So the next slide shows us, please, that darunavir actually works really well, even if you have up to two mutations in the protease inhibitor class. So darunavir is always a drug that we reach for when people have drug resistance, and darunavir is often still extremely active, and I really want people to remember darunavir as, as a good drug to use for resistance. The next slide actually shows us um, that even in the context of having NRTI resistance, so even if you have resistance to the nukes, those TAMs that I just talked about, that there have been four major studies published in the last two years that showed us that even with NRTI resistance, that dolotegravir or darunavir, which we just talked about, work really well, even with some NRTI resistance in the background. And so the reason that dolotegravir is first-line therapy worldwide, it's even second-line therapy worldwide. If you look at the World Health Organization guidelines, it's even recommended in the case of NRTI resistance, and that's because it still works really well, even if you have some mutations in the new class. So either dolotegravir or darunavir ritonavir works very well. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, so what are the four drugs we can use for multi-drug resistant HIV? Maybe we've gotten into a situation where there is a lot of resistance. Are there drugs that we can use for that? And there absolutely is. The right answer here is number three, Maraviroc, uh, Fostemsevir, Ibaluzumab, and Lenacapavir are all drugs that are developed and are now widely available for very resistant virus. And so we are in a very lucky phase to have all four of these medications available and we can combine them. Next slide, please. Um, what this next slide shows is that Maraviroc, which is what's called an entry inhibitor, it's a CCR5 receptor antagonist, works really well to, with people who have a lot of resistance. If you add it on to whatever regimen has some partial activity, if you add on Maraviroc, it can really bring down the viral load and we can get high rates of virologic suppression. And those studies were called Motivate 1 and Motivate 2. The next slide, please, shows us, um, uh, actually, I'm just going to go to the next slide in the interest of time. So, Fostemsevir is a drug that was developed purely for multidrug resistant HIV. This is a medication that's um, in a new class, actually. It's called an attachment inhibitor, but it really works at the beginning of the viral life cycle. And it's taken one pill twice a day, 600 milligrams twice a day, no major drug drug interactions, but it was developed purely for drug resistant virus. And giving that along with whatever works in the regimen, can bring down um, the viral load and cause high rates of virologic suppression. Next slide. This next drug is called ivaluzumab. And ivaluzumab is used very rarely because even though it's been de designed for multidrug resistant HIV, it is the only drug that we have that's given intravenously. And it's hard to give an IV drug. So I will say this is not used very often. And then finally, the next slide shows us lenacapavir. And lenacapavir is a brand new medication. It was just approved on December 12th, 2022 for multi-drug resistant HIV. It is a first medication in class. It is a what's called a capsid inhibitor. And it's given as a single injection in the stomach every 26 weeks, which is every six months. And it really works well next slide please, in multi-drug resistant HIV. And this was the study, it was called the Capella study. And please show us the next slide, that that shows us that if you use lenacapavir in patients who have a lots of drug resistance, that you can bring down the viral load very nicely in this small study. And I'm actually gonna end there. If you can go three slides ahead, I'll just end with my conclusion slide. Um, which is the next slide, the conclusion slide. And the reason I want to end is to give us plenty of time to discussion. So HIV drug resistance is more frequent in the non-nuke class. You have lots of good medications that can suppress virus. 
but you have to have a doctor who really knows about these um, new HIV medications like lenacapavir that help suppress resistant virus. Darunavir still works really well. Dilatinivir and Bictinivir are first and second line therapy worldwide, but we still have these other options if there's resistance to integrase inhibitors. And if we have time in the question and answer, we can talk about cabotegravir and molpivirine, the other long acting medications. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gandhi. Uh, very informative. And I'm looking forward also for the questions from the audience. Let's uh, now listen, uh, go to Nelson. He's going to bring us to a patient perspective uh, and advocacy view on HIV multidrug resistance. Nelson? Thank you, Moises. Uh, thank you to NMAC for inviting me. I haven't done one of these in a while. Uh, I've been uh, running my business, uh, got off disability, which is a good thing. Um, this is very personal, a very personal topic for me. I have very strong biases and opinions. I've been an activist since 1987. Uh, and my focus in the past um, 20 years probably has been multi-drug resistance. Uh, Dr. Gandhi has beautifully presented, thank God, it was a great intro, the fact that we are in a much better place in, two, in 2023 uh, compared to even five years ago or even six years ago. I have lived with multi-drug resistance forever. I developed resistance to every single drug um, since I started. I joined every single study in the 80s and 90s, and that exposed me to what we call sequential uh, monotherapy. Developed resistance to all classes. Uh, it wasn't until 10 years ago that I was put on Ivalizumab, which is Drogars, or the IV that the doctor talked about, and um, Maraviroc, that the, the doctor talked about it too, and um, Amraltergavir, and that finally brought my viral load to uh, undetectable. So it was a struggle, even though uh, I'm pretty well informed. I'm one of those, I'm 64 years old, one of those long-term survivors that was eager to join studies and help research to get us more drugs approved, but also many of us have been a victim of uh, research by being exposed to substandard uh, therapies back in the days. But hey, we are in a much better place. I'm a happy guy, to be honest with you, when, when it comes to multidrug persistence. However, uh, like, uh, like Dr. Gandhi said, it takes a very knowledgeable doctor to uh, manage patients like me and patients that have um, three, two, three, four class resistance and also have something I'm going to talk about that is very, it's not talked about a lot. Dr. Gandhi probably can agree with me. It's the immunologic non-response responders. Those people that have been like me undetectable for a while now, thank God, even with MDR, that have not reached the uh, CD4 levels over 300. Um, I live around 250, even though I, I take care of myself and everything else. So uh, there's a minority of those patients and that's what I call the next frontier for activism. So this is uh, next slide, please. I just gave a little intro on why this is so personal for me. And who are these people with multi-drug resistance? And Dr. Gandhi, I think did a pretty good review, but this is, I, I love graphs, <laughs> and this is a well done one. You know, some of us were exposed to the, well, first of all, I was I was diagnosed in 85, 86 when the test came out, and there was no, no drug, no treatments, till probably the late 80s where I joined the ACT study. I was, thank God I was put on placebo, I found out that later, because um, that was a high dose, and my partner died of, of in the treatment arm, with a thousand milligrams, I forgot how much it was. So we were jumping because we wanted to survive. And then obviously we joined the studies on DDI, D D4T, DDC, like the like doctor said, in the early 90s and developed sequential uh, monotherapy related uh, resistance. Some of us also joined the first study for protease inhibitors, uh, which was uh, the, Roche, the Roche drug for the base which was called something else back then, which only 10% of it got um, absorbed in the bloodstream and we developed resistance right away to, to most of the PI classes there, the protease inhibitors. So as I said, so, um, uh, I think many doctors, many conferences I go to, 
they they focus on the fact that multi drug resistance happens mostly because of lack of adherence. And that may be partly true, but they forget that there is a population of us, long term survivors aging with HIV, that were actually uh, volunteers for all these great drugs to be approved, but we suffer the consequences. And it's not like we knew any better, all doctors knew any better. It was, it was what it was. And some of us are alive, maybe, because we joined these studies. But um, I have to say, I do look back and say, hey, you were a little aggressive in your approach. Anyway, so by the, uh, in the late 90s, we had this hit hard, hit early, where they would put treat people on treatments right away. Some of them were not as great back in the late 90s and they developed resistance. Then we went through a phase of deferral of therapy. Um, and then obviously in the 2000s, we started getting the good treatments, uh, not only the good the PIs and then they integrate. So obviously things got better, but many of us lingered when it comes to uh, viral load. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is something I just drew uh, last week and it's not accurate. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Um, and hopefully um, people eventually, my, my activist friends, I'm part of the AIDS activist, AIDS activist uh, uh, treatment coalition uh, research coalition in, in the United States, around 50 of us, and I hopefully th them and clinicians can help me put some numbers together for this. But anyways, this is a data from 2019 from the CDC, where they, they explained that there's around 1.2 million of us in the United States with HIV. Unfortunately, 44% of those people have detectable viral load. Hopefully in 2023, we'll probably have a better number than that, but that's pretty pretty upsetting, pretty concerning, even though we have all these drugs and, and we have patient assistance programs, that there's still people out there with uh, detectable viral load. There are uh, 30, almost 35 new infections, although I just saw data last week that that decreased as significantly uh, last year. There's an estimated one, uh, one in eight people living with HIV that don't know they have it. So that's around 12.5%. I, I calculated, I have a little, a little drawing here on the ball, don't know. And about 66% of people living with HIV receive some kind of care, 50% retaining care, and 56% were have viral, uh, undetected viral load. So I, I drew a line here in the whole. So basically 56%. Some of us are multi-drug resistant, and I would say more like uh, two or three classes. Uh, and, and we don't know the percentage of total of us of the 1.2 million. I'm going to try to dig some, and Dr. Gandhi probably can help me find some references for that. But uh, I've seen numbers anywhere from 15 to 20 percent uh, have at least two, two plus uh, HIV, cl ARV plus resistance. But the, the and as, as Dr. Gandhi said, we have a lot more options for MDR, for the multi drug resistance. The INRs, immunological non-responders, and people like me, that most of us may, may be MDR, may have multi-drug resistance. I would say, I would probably assume most of us are, but I don't have the numbers. Some, not, some cohorts show that around 17% of people on long-term suppressive therapy with HIV, you know, HIV viral loads uh, undetectable, still do not reach CD4 cells uh, over 300, and they do not have a complete immune reconstitution. So that's why they're called immunological non-responders. They're virological responders because they're undetectable viral load, but they're immunological non-responders. So there is an overlap, obviously, in the MDR uh, multi drug resistant and the INR say immunological non responders. I live in this little hole here, in this little circle. Obviously, some of us have undetected viral load, some people may not. So, this is just a very extrapolated kind of um, figure I, I, I made to kind of show where, where we live. Some of us live basically in this circle, and some of us in the overlap of that. So, I'm my focus now as an activist, since MDR has been, is, been, is, is doing much better than MDR activist uh, research and, and pipeline, is concentrating on those of us and with INR. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, and, and um, 
the heavily treatment experience, that's how some of us, uh, some researchers call us, are obviously people with limited uh, treatment options. And Dr. Gandhi said there, that probably is not as critical in 2023 because we have great, um, really good drugs. Thank God. This is a very, we're a very privileged country in the United States. Most countries don't have access to those uh, newer drugs that uh, have uh, actually helped a lot. Um, and there are two primary target populations, obviously the older people like me that have been exposed to less potent regimens um, in the past and the young people that were born with HIV uh, years ago. So they're now adults with multidrug resistance. Next slide, please. And Dr. Gandhi uh, mentioned the uh, generic or uh, uh, names of all these drugs. I just wanted to show the, the brand name since we live in that world as a patient. We hardly hear, unless you're in research, hear the, the generic. But um, I'm actually taking, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, except, except Selenka. I'm, I'm definitely have my eye on that in case that I, uh, I fail what I'm on, which I'm not hoping to. But I'm on uh, Rukovia, which is for, since I rear, twice a day, big, big pills, no side effects, thank God. You can take it with or without food. Some of us are lucky enough to be r tropic, CCR5 uh, tropic, meaning our virus, because they're the X-force, which are a minority. But uh, many of us, uh, when we do a tropism test, and Dr. Gandhi mentioned it, turn out to be R5 uh, tropics. So we can take Maraviroc, that's also twice a day in my case. And I was on Trogarso um, until, until recently, long story, for eight years. I was on the phase two study and then the drug, the IV every two weeks got approved and I stayed on it for a while. So I have, ex you know, I have experience with this. And Pifeltro, which is a, a new, non-new, not new, it was probably approved like two or three years ago from Merck, has also shown very high uh, efficacy in people with pre-existing non-nuke mutations. Uh, in my case, I was exposed to the uh, to uh, uh, to uh, Sustiva and uh, Nirapine and had resistance, and P filter actually worked. So I'm taking that drug too. <clears throat> and obviously, the new drug that Dr. Organdi said it was approved in December last year is the injectable every six months. Very exciting. Uh, it's a new class. Um, we still, I'm still looking for more data post approval, and um, and Gilead is doing some research with other long acting agents um, that may work with it. So we're kind of excited, exciting that long acting. Is the there are two long acting agents in multidrug resistance. Drogarso is long acting; it's every two weeks, and now Sulenka, which is every six months. So that's something I never thought I would have in my life. So that's definitely a plus. Next next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'm gonna jump into my, my, new, my new obsession, uh, the INR activism. Next slide, please. We met with the FDA like six years ago and they were very, and that's a long story, I'm not gonna, because I don't have much time, but the FDA is, is very supportive of any new research done in this population that basically has been left behind. Uh, most people with HIV reach really good CD4 levels, like Dr. Gandhi said. Uh, the rapid increase in CD4 usually happens in the beginning of treatment, like three months or so, but if followed by steady increases over time. So people get to be over 500 CD4s, which is considered normal immune response or good immune response. So, uh, maintenance of um, viral suppression results in most, most people eventually recovering to quote unquote normal T cells. But 15 to 20 percent of us uh, who started uh, treatment at low CD4 levels, I didn't, I started at 350, may plateau um, at low counts and have poor CD4 cell recovery. Even, even those of us that have been undetectable, have had undetectable viral load for many years. Um, just, you know, and as we age, some of us start losing CD4s uh, due to um, basically aging of the immune system itself. So that's an area that needs to be uh, researched more. Uh, actually, those patients are excluded from studies in many, in many times uh, with low CD4 counts. And also a lot of us are older 
than 60, and a lot of studies are excluding people that are older than 60 uh, years of age. So uh, uh, the age screening and activist coalition were really fighting hard to get more uh, inclusion of people with lower CD4 cells and also older uh, patients over 60, 65. So that's probably going to happen soon. We're, we're really making a lot of inroads in that. And obviously, the earlier you start in your infection, the better your, your chances for immune uh, CD4 cell recovery. Next slide, please. And this is basically an old um, cohort uh, published in 2012, where basically showing that the lower your CD4 cells, uh, the higher your chances of not only uh, mortality, but also illness and comorbidities. So, and it's something that everybody knows. I mean, as a patient, I know it as an activist, doctors know it. Um, and and the, the, the hardest thing in activism has been how to define what a patient with immunologic non response is. What is the magic number? Is it 200, 250, 350? So, that's a continuing debate right now because it makes a big difference for uh, the, the, the future uh, activist work that we're doing for bio pharma by small companies commercially, that bigger companies are not really interested in this population, but the biologics coming through and the gene therapy companies are really definitely interested and in who those are the our targets for activism. Next slide, please. And we um, we have a group, as I said, and the treatment action group is, is one of the leads in New York. Um, I'm, I'm a co-author of uh, a proposal we made to the FDA. The thing about treating our activists, our research in this population of low, lower T cells is that, um, um, well, first of all, there's a stigma, there's a big fear from companies because of the history that we have with IL-2. IL-2 basically increased CD4s dramatically, but at the end of the review of the data, we showed no improvements in, in survival. Obviously, back then, we didn't have as great treatments as we do now. So we cannot really do studies on, based on survival because they'll take forever and we'll never get it done. So now we're trying to uh, convince companies, especially biotech companies, that there are other measures of response if we can show that people not only have more CD4 cells, but also have other patient-reported outcomes like um, decreased in GI, related uh, upset, which a lot of us have GI issues, or fatigue, or qual general quality of life or functional capacity. So those uh, patient uh, self-reported outcomes, it, it will be a new approach to uh, doing studies in this population as we show that CD4 uh, can be boosted by different treatments. Uh, so we're, we're working on it. We've been working on it for six years. We're only making new roads now. So, but the FDA is super, super, has been super amazingly supportive. Next slide, please. So, and this is what got me excited uh, this last February uh, in, at Croy. This is a, <clears throat> a long-term review of six years, the past six, six, seven years by Dr. Uh, Rafiq and his team all over, all over the world. I mean, they're in, in Cleveland, in case Sangamo uh, was a small biologic uh, company uh, that did most of the previous studies. And Montreal, there are people in Switzerland, in California, et cetera, doing, doing the study. But anyways, this is, this is the, the data was presented on six, uh, nine patients that have been followed since around seven years ago until now. Um, Sangamo was a small biotech company that we really wanted uh, to support to uh, expand their, their, their data. And I'm going to show what they did. But this is actually a review, a seven year. Uh, now we have ex experience with human data, a small cohort that has been, um, has been living with higher T cells due to uh, gene, gene therapy. The next slide, please. And that really woke up a lot of us that have been working on this field, but kind of feel discouraged in the in the few in the few years that we've had no response from industry. 
So basically, this was uh, done uh, several years ago, like six, seven years ago by Sangamo, where they would um, bring people with multi-drug resistance and long-term survivors that had uh, undetected viral load. They brought them in, um, extracted their, their, their T cells, enriched the T cells in the lab, the CD4 cells, uh, modified them with what we call zinc finger nuclease by, by deleting, by actually cut, uh, cutting off the CCR5 receptor that HIV uses to infect. So basically making the, the CD4 cells uh, resistant to HIV, uh, we expand them and infuse them back. This happened only once per patient, only once. And um, it was kind of a, con a, 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 a concept, of, a proof of concept. And it was actually partially funded by the NIH. What they found, and this is a two year to three, four year review, is that um, not only that one infusion of the CCR5 modified uh, T cells, not only um, increased CD4s and they were sustained, those CD4 increases, but also the, the reservoir, the HIV DNA, had been reduced even after two years of a follow-up by one single infusion. This company, believe it or not, even with this juicy data that we got, this is what got us excited. And we actually did that proposal to the FDA. They, they basically either run out of money or really kind of saw HIV INR is a too small of a population, so they moved to oncology, where everybody's working on now, you know, cancer research. There's more money in that, and that's my own personal opinion, by the way. So this this technology is still there, but Dr. Rafik, uh, the main investigator, six years ago, did not abandon it. That's something we did not know until Croy that he kept going. He says, "I am going to keep going with this because it is something that we need to look at." Next, next one, please. So what he also found, Dr. Rafiq, is that yes, uh, he did an analysis not only of these nine patients, but also found out that there is a specific CD4 cell, um, he called it Aurora, and don't ask me what that means because it's a long, long acronym for something, that these T cells are the younger T cells, almost like stem cell-like T cells, the ones that are like the mother of all the T cells, Actually, the ones that are more, uh, he correlated them more to, to this sustained immune uh, response. And they actually survived uh, even after six years. Some of these nine patients still have the, this RORA modified, CCR5 modified T cells. So they, they were shocked, he was, and we were, that these T cells have still in, 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 in those patients' bodies after so long with one infusion. So he's also identified this type of T cells as the key T cells. So now he's proceeding into doing the same type of study, but only using um, a, a, a growth factor for the RORA T cells, the ones that make the most impact. So that's something that I'm excited about, obviously, for obvious reasons, because I have personal interest. And um, I'm really trying to support. This is a tiny little company, RORA Biologics, uh, that as most biotechs don't have money and they're trying to get funded by, by equity firms. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> so basically he's, do, he's gonna do or the same, or he's already enrolled some patients in a small pilot um, where he's doing the same as Sangamo did six, seven years ago, uh, extract um, T cells obviously uh, from the patients, expand just that subset of T cells, Aurora T cells, um, and obviously treat them to delete their CCF5 receptor, grow them in the labs, and reinfuse them into patients. So basically it's a more concentrated um, uh, infusion of the most highly effective pseudo, uh, and I would hate to call them that, stem cell type CD4 cells. And that's where we are at now and as an activist group, we are behind. And we usually don't get behind industry because <laughs> it's not, uh, but in this case, it's such a small company with such a, a unique approach. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Rafiq never gave up and he's really a friend of the community. We, we really have good. So this is what gets me excited to really find a way to get this concept 
it, uh, more data, obviously, because we have, we need more human data. And to get this, uh, and not only do the study, but, but prove that those increased T cells, those, those additional T cells actually are doing something for us. Because obviously we cannot prove to anybody that we're gonna live longer. Like for instance, I have 250 T cells. If my T cells were 500 and were, most of them were CCR5 modified PRORA T cells, will I live any longer or will I feel any different? Will I have better energy levels, better GI? We don't know. So that's where we are at now. The FDA says pick an endpoint and find a way to prove whether or not this increased T cells make any difference. So that's where we are. It's exciting. I think the new, hopefully the story will, will be uh, better in six months. Next next uh, slide is my last one. And I apologize for probably talking too much anyways. Summary, Dr. Gandhi probably, she said most of this. So um, we need activists um, and we need more activism, in, especially in the immunological non-responder area. Boosting T cells, I think it's gonna benefit the world in general. We can be used as guinea pigs for an immune boosting therapy, uh, especially for the rest of the world, to, uh, to improve immune function for not only us, but for many people. And uh, that's how I see it. it. It is personalized. Every single patient has a personalized treatment. So obviously this can be made in you know, mass quantities, like an oral or biologics, but, um, but I, I see this as probably the closest, is it the only option we have where we have more humans exposed to this for so long and they're doing well. So thank you very much. And email me if you need uh, more information or if you wanna get involved. Thank, thank you, Nelson. You. You, you are one of my heroes for the last 30 years. And you know when I always hear about your issues on drug resistance, I was always more worried about you that, than me in that sense, you know. It's like, oh my God, you know, Nelson need new drugs. <laughs> um, so it's very, very great to see you here and, and with the same passion and dedication. So let's let's start to get some questions. Um, I don't know if we have questions from the audience, but uh, see if the guys, uh, look for them. I'm going to start with one question, and maybe for both of you. And it's that, um, you know, with the whole issue of aging with HIV, you know, we we have to, you know, like we talked today, you have to deal with HIV, deal with the viral suppression. But as, as we move toward, you know, more different kind of uh, management, right? we are going to have to learn, and it reminded me the early days, right? To er learn to live not only with HIV, know how to maintain it, suppress, but also live with comorbidities and not just one, but multiple comorbidities on top of HIV. And that, you know, I think that people, we tend to compartmentalize things, but we need to see these two things together as we want to be effective in how to, I mean, for the doctors, how to monitor the health of the patient that is not only about viral suppression. And, and also for those, some of us having resistance to antibiotics is also an issue. Um, I almost, got, almost like you, Nelson, I had, I'm Omar Abirak and Repivirin and doing the because um, I've resisted to NNRTIs. So, but, but my concern now is, you know, with HIV, I think there are a couple of drugs on development. With HIV plus multiple comorbidities, you know, it concerns me that as you get older and not have the same energy and, you know, your mind is not so alert as before that you know, we, we risk to get into adherence issues um, and or doctors are not monitoring how you responding to drug-drug interactions, which is another issue that I think it's important to, to understand. So if any of you want to comment on that, how the paradigm is shifting and how you know, we have to do more than just viral suppression. And I would say that, um, you know, if you are on Maraviroc, Postemsevere, 
if you're on these twice a day medications for drug resistance, talk to your provider about lenacaprevir. And the reason I would say that is it makes it so much easier to take a one subcutaneous injection every six months for MDR HIV. I think it's pretty remarkable that we have it. I think it's going to be a big deal to have such a long acting medication. This is probably the only I mean, this is the only medication that we have that's given every six months, and that can really cut down on the fatigue of taking a twice-a-day medication. Uh, and it seems to have few side effects, though it does have the injection site reactions, but it's once every six months. So we have been changing a lot of people uh, since December 2022 who have multi-drug resistant HIV over to lenacapavir. And then Think about cabotegravir and rolpivirine with it. We just put in a um, concept sheet to the companies in the ACTG to study lenacapavir and cabotegravir alone. Cabotegravir can be once a month. It can even be every two months with lenacapavir every six months in people who have NNRTI resistance. That means that rolpivirine would not work. Um, we have even given people rolpivirine, cabotegravir, and lenacapavir at UCSF at Ward 86 um, to try to get them on an all injectable regimen if they have susceptibility to uh, the cabotegravir, which is an INSTI, and the ropivirine. So moving people on to long acting, which I know we're kind of in the baby nascent phases of long acting, we're going to get better long actings, but at this point, these are what's available, cabotegravir, ropivirine, lenacapavir. Long acting could do a lot in terms of reducing that fatigue of taking pills every day. Great. You know, some patients said uh, they they are so set on their routine with pills that I have hear some people say, I don't need the injections, you know, I can I do well with the pills. So there yeah. is some work to do about, you know, educating people on that. Yeah. Nelson, do you have any comment around that? I have a very strong bias. Because obviously I was on a long acting um, every two weeks, which is back then it was what we call long acting. Obviously now six months is long acting. And the reason I stopped Trogarso, which is Ivalizumab, that's is a hard one though. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, like yeah, you know, getting out of the house every two weeks. It's, it's like a, yeah. no no side effects, and you know I was I did well. I, I had a great nurse that I we chatted for 20 minutes. But anyways. Uh, is because they forgot to order a refill um, and by Thanksgiving, so the refill didn't get in, and Ivalizumab, you basically right. stop, and right away you develop resistance. So oh, no. that left me with a sour taste in my mouth about long acting and the dependence on providers for refill, uh, you know, reminders and or whatever. They, I, I think I was doing it for seven years, so I assumed uh, so that gave me a first-hand experience on depending on somebody else to get me a refill to something. So I am not jumping mm -hmm. into acting because of that. Something else as we get older, we're taking blood pressure meds, we're take, some people are taking statins, uh, or whatever, we're taking some vitamins. So the overall twice a day, at least in my case, is, is not an issue, especially if you're long-term. I can see how, yes, after we get older and hopefully cognitively, if we start losing cognitive abilities, that's my concern that we start skipping meds or that we have to have a, a caregiver. Um, I'm, a lot of us are getting concerned about aging with HIV, especially after seeing data that most people aging with HIV are living alone. I'm very concerned about that, uh, very concerned. I just saw uh, a good report from um, the group in New York, I uh, forgot <laughs> what's looking at, that the number one quality of life complaint of people aging with HIV is pain, um, chronic pain, especially low back pain and joint pain, knee pain. So that's something else that, um, and I have it, I have lower back pain and back surgery. So there are many concerns. I think a lot of us uh, have been feeling very happy that we live this long. Um, but now they're entering the 60s and 70s. We also have to take care of our parents and ourselves. So there's a lot, it's a new, new changing in worries, not only worries of long-term um, complications, uh, like some of us have, I've had cancer, I've had neuro neurological issues, I've had issues that are probably uh, tied to my lower T-cells. 
but also the fact that um, that you know we we have accelerated aging, 10 to 15 years. Are we going to? Some of us may or may not have a support system. To, and there's no such a thing as uh, gay-friendly or LGBTQ-friendly retirement facilities. So there's a lot of complexity coming our way. And I'm very happy in, in MAC and a lot of um, NGOs are really concentrating on this because yeah. there's, you know, anyways. <laughs> I love it. Uh, no, you said it. You know, things are getting more complicated. We have yeah. two questions from the audience. Let's see if we can. Um, I know we are there but i kind of feel like let's see if we can honor one of those questions is that okay with you yes okay can uh Danielle or jonathan could you tell me uh which questions we have so the first question is what are others experience with post racobia i was in the bright study and continue with this medication this is the longest i have maintained viral suppression I mean, I would just say, post. I mean, again, if you could take it, it's a great drug, post-temsevir. It's the entire point of it is for multidrug resistant HIV, and people have done equally as well. We are only switching people to the long-acting, and we're kind of, the them out is hard. It's an intravenous drug. You actually have to put in an IV and get it every two weeks. I'm impressed that you did that, Nelson. But these other, these other, and I'm sorry to hear about the lack of refills over a break, but these other injectables are shots, um, either capitagvir and ropivirine are shots um, that are intramuscular and the lenocapivir subcutaneous. So the reason I wanted to talk about them is to tell you, you that if you're interested, you can certainly talk to your provider about it. But for those who can take a twice a day medication like post severe, great, people are doing really well. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gandhi. And the, the next question, has there be, been any success in accessing lenacaprevir for those with MDR but suppressed VL who wish to sim simplify their regimen? Yes, this is such a good question because we have been doing this for people, but we live in Cal I live in California. So in California, we have a Medicaid expansion. And for some reason, and in on public insurance, we've had zero problems. Um, getting uh, getting um, uh, lenacapavir. And at least for people on Medicare and Medicaid, I know that people with private insurance have had a harder time. So it's kind of this irony that it's easier to get injectables on public insurance right now. Yeah. All right, any other questions there now? Yes, we have two more. At what viral load count number should we worry about drug resistance? 200, 500, what number? Well, you know, people will say that it's the 200. And why? Because 200 is sort of that cutoff where undetectable equals untransmittable. All the cohort studies showed U equals U at 200. And um, so I think that I think of that as kind of a magic number that you can't you can't pass on virus at that point, and I wouldn't want people to have above 200 for too long because I think they can evolve resistance. Any yeah. comment about that, David? All right, uh, then now what's the next one? Uh, the final question, I think it was supposed to probably be in regards to Lena Caprivir. It said, can a drug resistance to Sustiva take this? I mean, Sestiva, if you have drug resistance to that, which is a favorant, you have lots of options because you can use integrase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, and then any of those oral ones that we just said, but absolutely lenacapivir can be used if you've, if you've become resistant to, to a favorant, for sure. Great. All right. So thank you, both of you. This has been very informative. Um, we had great attendance. And um, this is very kind of life-saving information for a lot of people in this group. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gandhi. Thank you, Nelson. And um, if there is any questions with the audience, you can address it to us, and we can make sure that either Nelson or Dr. Gandhi address it. Um, Nelson shared his email, so I know he likes to work with community a lot, and Dr. Gandhi as well. All right, so have a great weekend and talk to you in the next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.